Tom here from Warrant Systems. It is May 31st of 2025, and the new PFSense Community Edition 2.8.0 was released just a few days ago. This update brings a lot of enhancements along with some performance improvements and security fixes. In this video, we'll explore the new features of 2.8, and of course, I'll be talking about the new installer and the Kia DHCP server changes. But before we get started, here's a word from a sponsor of today's video, Huntress. You have a lot of data to manage. Security Information and Event Management, or SIM, was designed to help. But most SIMs are overly complicated, create noisy data, and are way too expensive. Huntress Managed SIM is built to give you everything you need from a SIM and nothing you don't. Get their smart filtering to cut through noisy data, 24-7 monitoring from their expert SOC, and compliance assistance, all at a clear, predictable price. Follow the link in the description below and experience Managed SIM for yourself with a free trial. The best place to start is always at the beginning. That means talking about the installer. Now this is dated February 29th of 2024. So it's been a little over a year since they've launched this. It's kind of out of beta now, and it's now the default way to install PFSense. And this covers both the CE and Plus editions. This is the blog post I will link to down below for those of you that wanna know why they changed this, but I wanna show you functionally how that works. You can still come over here to the latest stable version download page. You can see that it's 2.8 now. You'll click download. It'll then bring you to their shopping page. Now there's no charge for this, but it will require if we add this to cart, enter the cart, go to the checkout, you have to have a login or you can create a login for free. There's no charge for the software, but it will only give you a download ISO of the installer, not the actual PFSense 2.8. There's plenty of discussion already on Reddit. If you want to leave your comments down below on it, I'm also going to leave a link, as I said, to that blog post. I don't control writing the software, so that's as much as I want to do is cover. This is how you obtain it. Now let's walk through how that installer works. I'm doing this in my virtual environment, but it works the same if you're doing this on real hardware for installing it new. It goes to what looks like and it is pretty much the same install process, but there's a little trick here that it's going to do. It does require that you have internet access. Now, obviously this is a virtual machine, therefore it is not directly connected to the internet. Having internet access and being directly connected with the WAN to a public IP are two different things. You don't need to have a public IP. This will work to load this behind another firewall. So if you are behind a firewall, you're loading a piece of hardware, you just plug the WAN into the LAN and it'll get an IP address and you can go through the install process. As I said, the install process is pretty much the same. It's going to ask to install PFSense, but this is the part where it's going to want to verify that there's an active connection. XNN0 is the one I'm going to assign for WAN. It does have access. So we go ahead and click continue. I'm going to skip assigning the LAN interface for now, as I don't need to. I've already done that before on another one. This is just to show you how the installer works. We'll continue. Verify the internet connection. Trying to reach NetGate service, please wait. As long as it can get a DHCP address, it'll download and finish the install of PFSense. Now, what it did here, though, was also check to see if this system, and I believe it does so by the MAC addresses and a machine ID that's generated, to check if it has a valid license for PFSense Plus. So if you're someone who's buying a subscription or you're loading this on a NetGate device, it'll go, hey, I recognize this and there's a valid license. And you can retry the validation if you think there was an error, or you can just go ahead and install the CE version when doing this. Then it does a normal procedure, just like before. Next, yes, what drive you're going to install it on and goes through and lets you choose the version here. So I can still go to the old version if I want, previous stable or current stable, 2.8. And after this, it's a normal install process. Now, how fast this install goes is really dependent on how fast your system is. But once it's installed and pulls all these packages, it reboots and works like a normal PFSense install would. Before we get into the release notes, I wanna start with the warning. This warning right here, due to major changes in PHP and base OS version, there is a higher than usual chance that packages will interfere with the upgrade process. Now, if you're like me, I just hit it and see what happens, but I do recommend if you want the best, most smooth experience, 
follow their pre-upgrade task section of the upgrade guide, which says remove the packages. I've covered this before in videos. Removing a package does not mean deleting all the settings you may have put into that package that's stored in the XML file. And with packages, unless you implicitly tell them, and there's a checkbox for this, to remove those settings, they stay and the package can be removed and reloaded. Sometimes that's even how you fix a package when it's got some weird issue. You can just remove it and reload it and it will pull the settings back in. The times when it doesn't, sometimes you do want to reset up a package. And well, that's a per case basis when you just want to dump all the settings and just install a package clean. There is a checkbox for that, but that requires an extra step. Follow their guide here for the best experience is what I want to say for those of you that aren't installing fresh and are just doing an in-place upgrade. Legacy Serial Council, a few notes here. They have uh, what the manual intervention might be. There's some renaming of serial devices. You may have some bugs if you're doing that. I don't know how often that's used, but for some people that may be something interesting. Updated bootloader, nothing you have to do if you're installing fresh. If you have a previous install, they have a guide on this because if you have it installed in more than one device and an MMC device still has content on there, you may have a problem. And if you have less than a gig, Really, it's probably time to replace your hardware, but you also may have some problems as well. Now let's get to the first feature. It's the automatic configuration backup, also called auto config backup or ACB is a free service that Netgate provides the features and encrypts backups of the PFSense software configuration and uploads those encrypted backups to Netgate cloud storage servers. I really like this service. I think it's awesome. There were some security issues someone was able to find. I'll talk about some security things on it the end of the video. But overall, I think this is a great service that they offer for free to be able to just to automatically back up. And I would choose it to automatically back up every time you make a configuration change. That will also give you a list of restores here. And so you can go back and make sure you follow the process and follow documentation or watch my video on this. Make sure you also back up these device keys in here because that's part of it. You also have to set a password. It's not optional. Netgate does not want a copy of your data that they can decrypt. So set a good password, then remember what you set that password to. That is a very important piece of information in order to get this to restore. They don't have a way of doing this. If I remove the password, it will fail. It won't do the backup. So a couple things just to keep in mind there. And that's why they even remind you, keep a secure copy of this value. But that's a good feature if you want it to automatically back up. It's not enabled by default. I did check the enable boxes. I wanted to test it and it seems to work fine. Now, the next thing is a new PPUE driver. I have heard from the forums and from people that this is faster. It does require a checkbox to opt into this, but this is something that I know is a challenge for some people getting PPUE to work right or get it to perform well, but I don't have any way to test or validate this. So I'll just leave it here for you to read the documentation. Kia DHCP feature integration. This has been coming for a while. The Kia DHCP server, when it was first released, was just missing a lot of things. And I had mentioned many times when I was trying to do something, I would just use the ISC. I mentioned that in several of my videos. Uh, I know it was deprecated even when I did the video, but if I wanted to be able to do those features, it, the only way I could do it was with ISC. They finally got a lot of that functionality brought up to Kia. Now, this has already been going on in PFSense Plus with their updates. Now it's also in PFSense CE. So now we have the high availability in Kia DHCP. We have DNS registration, DHCP client host names. There is also static art support. Custom configuration enables users to implement Kia features, options, not support in PFSense software GUI by updating JSON snippets. I like that you can just paste them in at the bottom in properly formatted JSON and then add that extended functionality. Now to set Kia DHCP to enable, there is a checkbox here and I just got it set to Kia. If you're still on the old version, like if you did an in-place upgrade and you have a bunch of configuration, when you do this, it should copy all that configuration, static leases, et cetera, over to Kia DHCP. HTTP when you click the save here. But if we go to the services and DHCP server, now that we're on the Kia one, we go over here to LAN, it's enabled. And here is a lot more functionality than we had before, being able to set certain details that were just not available to us. And here's where you would paste in that JSON configuration. Also, we have the network booting, which I know was something a lot of people asked, and NTP servers. I believe in 2.7, I forgot to look. I don't think that was available yet in the CE version. Most of the systems they have are plus, but now you can set those, and that's great. Those are the features that were really important to a lot of people, and for anyone that needs a couple more functionality, extra things added, well, we just can throw that in a JSON configuration if you have something really custom. So they've 
expanded this a lot, and I'm sure they'll keep expanding it more in the future. Nat64, this contains full release for Nat64, and I'm going to make a bunch of people angry right now by saying, I already disabled IPv6 on my PFSense, so I'll skip over that. I just don't do a lot of IPv6. There's other people that want to do that, and that's fine. I'm not telling you not to. I'm just telling you I skip it because IPv6 is, well, a, a great argument you guys can have in the comments. Gateway fail back. This one is important. This release includes support for enhanced gateway recovery fail back by optionally clearing states from lower tier gateways when a more preferred gateway recovers. This allows the firewall to force connections back to a higher party gateway when it recovers, which can help environments with lower party gateways having significantly lower bandwidth or meter charges. I've done this in my failover video. It can be very sticky that once a gateway fails and it goes to the other one, those connections will stay on that gateway, which is generally ideal because you don't want to keep resetting users because it breaks sessions to move them over to another gateway. This means go ahead and break that session because I don't want them on my lower bandwidth. Maybe it's a metered connection or a cell connection, and this is a way to set settings that will allow it to force them off. So this is definitely an enhancement. System aliases. This release contains new built-in system aliases, and these were previously only usable by internal firewall rules. And what do those look like? Well, it's these right here. This allows you to add a few other features to build more advanced rules. So instead of just having SSH card contain information that you can't apply, you can now take and build out a rule to more than just uses it against the SSH card. So someone brute forces gets in that list, we can then take that SSH card list and build it into a rule because maybe we want to block something else as well. That's just an example. There's a few of them in here. There's also networks for IPsec VPN PPOE servers. Instead of having to maintain a rule that maybe has to talk about those networks and refer to them, you can just say VPN networks. That way, as you build VPN networks, that rule will be dynamically updated to, well, list out the VPN networks or NetGate networks, networks to exclude from policy routing with any destination, et cetera. So there's a lot of good new features in here for helping you build out rules. Now the state policy changes may not affect you except for in very specific situations. And this is a more secure way to handle it, but of course causes a little bit of issue for IPsec VTI multi-WAN policy routing. So read through here, read through the details if this affects you. If not, just leave it alone and allow it to use the better system. Now let's talk about security advisories, but let's mention system patches for previous versions. There is a lot of concern people have because the 2.72 version was from such a long time ago. And of course, we're still on, if you're on PFSense Plus, 2411. Let's talk about the system patches and how this gets fixed. So this is all fixed in version 2.8, so there's nothing to see here. But if we go over to my PFSense Plus system, you can see that I've applied quite a few patches. Now, this package is not loaded by default, but it's really easy. Just go to system, your packages, you load patching, and then you apply all the patches. Patches. This is what allows between these versions. So people who still haven't even upgraded from 272, you can still be protected against these particular security advisories. This is how in between major release updates, PFSense handles fixing bugs that are found. Also, let's talk about the bugs because that's important. Firewalls are supposed to keep people outside of your network, still outside your network unless you wanted them in. And that is something about specifically all these cross-site scripting ones that matters a lot because they do require that you have a valid username and password to get into the firewall. Then it would be a user that you've created that's not you, the admin, but some other user that has lesser privileges, but does have privileges to any of these particular pages. And there's a chance they could use that to do nefarious things on the firewall. That's what each of these security advisories that say XSS or cross-site scripting are about. They're not not an automatic, oh my gosh, there's a problem. It's a, hey, they need a login. They need access to that page. Frequently, you don't give other people access. Even if you're creating a VPN user, you shouldn't be granting them any web admin access. And if you're in a larger environment, you may have multiple admins, but you may granularly control those admin permissions. That is where their concern would be is that an admin would then use this who already has valid credentials to elevate or make modifications to the system that they were not supposed to make, either by elevating their permissions to do so, or in a case, 
of the OpenVPN management interface, if you gave them access to OpenVPN via the dashboard widget, they could possibly inject something in there. That's what that one was about as well. So it's either command injection or potential cross-site scripting, but all these require valid logins, not just an exposed management interface to the internet. Please don't do that, but that is not enough to cause this problem. Now, the last one here that's different, that's not cross-site scripting, is potential disclosure of auto-config backup device key if SSH service is enabled and exposed to untrusted networks. This is an interesting one because there's a potential disclosure of your auto config backup device key. Now, as I mentioned earlier, auto config backup forces you to use a password. That's not a new feature. That's how it is. But if someone were able to derive that device key, they would be able to potentially manipulate your backups as in delete them. That's terrible. And now, as I mentioned, also, this is not a service enabled by default. And hopefully you don't have SSH exposed and hopefully no one's going through this trouble to try to delete your backups that are only in some auto config. But it's an interesting write up. This was found by security researchers. Actually, pretty much all these were. So it's not like these were exploited in the wild. But well, nonetheless, I find it really interesting that someone uh, poked away at it. And of course, NetGate responded and fixed it in this update. Now, I also want to leave you a link to this right up here for those of you that want to dive deeper into how these bugs were found. As I said, these are not found in the wild. This is from a security researcher who did a whole write up, followed a responsible vulnerability disclosure process, contacted NetGate, and has all the details for those of you curious. And I like these write-ups because they give you good education by how security is handled, how security researchers look at things, how then the company responds to security researchers. And that's the important part here that is right at the bottom. On 11-15 of 2024, vulnerability reported to security at netgate.com. Vulnerability acknowledged on 11 15, 2024 12 2, pushed to master on all widgets, found a workaround for the patch, another patch was provided. This is the proper back and forth. They address things, it takes time to get these fixes, understand them, acknowledge them talk to the security researcher, but then the security researcher may poke a little harder and say, I think you fixed it in a way that I might be able to still get around. So found a workaround for the patch in another day, a updated patch was pushed to PFS PFSense master. And then we have a CVE assigned. So this is the timeline for it happening, NetGate communicating back and forth. This is what we want to see out of any company that we find a flaw in, that they communicate and acknowledge that they work with security researchers, and then they set a timeline for disclosure because you want to give time for people to patch everything. And as I noted, that patches feature of PFSense allowed for these features to be patched while this was being addressed until a major release came out, which is currently the 2.8. Now, I didn't do any upgrade testing since our clients that run PFSense are all using hardware from NetGate, therefore running the PFSense Plus version. I still think PFSense CE is the most stable and most full-featured open source firewall available here in 2025. If you've got thoughts, questions, or different takes about today's topic, drop them in the comments below. I always enjoy hearing and learning from all of you. For deeper technical dives and ongoing discussions, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we've got a great community of people just like you to engage with on this and other topics. If you want to help support the channel and what I do over here, check out our Patreon or swag store where you can get the new verbose shirt. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're looking to connect with me or learn more about the services we offer, head over to lawrencesystems.com. You'll find links to all my socials and ways to get in touch. Thanks for watching. I hope your upgrades go smooth.